Hello, I'm Claire Freeman, Director of the Natural History Society of Northumbria. Welcome to this week's talk, one in a series of NHSN's Winter Nature Talks programme. As a society, we've been sharing talks since the year we were founded in 1829. And in those early years, many people would have been isolated in their pursuit of natural history. So over those 191 years since, we have been bringing people together to hear about the latest discoveries and environmental findings. This year, digital technology, we hope, will enable us to share the talks with many more people to inspire them to care for and protect nature. Please do visit our website to find out more about NHSN and also you might like to keep in touch with us for news about North East Nature. I now hand over to one of my colleagues who will introduce this week's speakers and I hope you enjoy the talks. Hello, my name is Derek Teasdale and I am the Earth Sciences Section Lead at the Natural History Society of Northumbria. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, the speaker for this talk, who is Heather Devi, and she's going to be talking to us about the Eurasian beaver and uh, possibilities of reintroduction of that species. Uh, Heather is the uh, a project officer for the Cumbria Beaver Group. Uh, the Cumbria Beaver Group's uh, partners include the RSPB, uh, Cumbria Wildlife Trust, the Eden Rivers Trust, and the Lowther Estates. Uh, Heather also works for uh, the RSPB at uh, Horsewater and runs an organisation called Wild Intrigue, which does, does trips. Um, so we're going to be talking about the Eurasian beaver. Uh, it's one of the key uh, stone uh, species uh, when it's reintroduced to an area. Uh, they're great environmental engineers um, and they have a huge impact on the species around them and the landscape around them, perhaps uh, greater than we'd think from the actual absolute numbers of them in the landscape. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Heather. Hello everyone. Like all of you, I am so pleased these Natural History Society of Northumbria talks have been able to go ahead. So before I begin, I'd like to say a great big thank you to the innovative team for finding a way to bring nature to us all in this uh, most trying time. I'm honoured to be giving this talk to you all tonight. Um, it's about time we got reacquainted with a species that we co-evolved alongside up until a mere 400 years ago. So whether you're a beaver believer already or not quite just yet, um, I hope you enjoy tonight's talk. So my name is Heather Devi. I'm the project officer for the Cumbria Beaver Group. And the Cumbria Beaver Group, the primary partners of that are the RSPB, and the Cumbria Wildlife Trust, Eden Rivers Trust, and the Lowther Estate. Of course, we work in consultation with the likes of Natural England, the University of Cumbria, Forestry Commission, a whole load of other organisations. But tonight I'm here to reintroduce you to a really exciting species, the Eurasian beaver. If you hadn't already heard the exciting news, the Lowther Estate was the first site in Cumbria to be approved a license by DEFRA for a managed enclosed release of beavers back in January this year. So this approval was dependent on a number of factors, including a feasibility study being undertaken of the site and adhering to specific fencing requirements. The project has, like everything else in the world, been delayed due to this year's unexpected events, though we are expecting to share some exciting information on this soon. Now there's a lot when it comes to beavers to cover, so this really is a whistle-stop tour. Let's start where it all went wrong, um, the extinction of beavers in Britain. When I talk about beavers in Britain, I'm referring to the Eurasian beaver, Castor fiber, which had been present in Britain up until around 400 years ago, depending on the region. It's relative to North American beaver, Castor canadensis, however, um, has never been in Britain. Um, and this species isn't considered for a reintroduction here. Beavers were hunted primarily for three things meat, fur and castorium, so let's have a quick run through these. Beaver meat was particularly popular because the Roman church declared beavers as a fish due to its swift ability as a swimmer 
Um, so they were able to eat the beavers during periods of fast. Another product derived from beavers is castorium, an oil-like substance which is used to help waterproof their fur and they rub it onto themselves to help with that um, and as a scented secretion to map the territories. So this is where it gets really interesting. This is processed in their castor sacs. So beavers actually have an incredible anatomical feature called a cloaca which many of you might know is present in birds, amphibians, reptiles, many other groups, um, but rather uncommon in mammals. Very quickly, <laughs> a cloaca is essentially a, um, a sort of fleshy vent that has a threefold duty of scent secretion, waste disposal and reproduction. So for this reason, male and female beavers are almost impossible to identify to the casual observer because they don't have external genitalia. However, the castor sacs are found in both sexes, not just males, as a lot of folk presume. This hasn't always been common knowledge. This is a frequent image found in medieval bestiaries. It depicts a male beaver um, chewing off his testes, yikes. Um, the image also doubled up at the time as a moral representation of, um, of a voluntary sacrifice, I suppose, to avert greater loss. But perhaps it came about when people found beavers, perhaps dead, um, seemingly without their testicles. So castorium was used as a bit of a cure for all remedy um, up until around about the 1700s, particularly as an aphrodisiac, um, a cure for epilepsy and as a pain reliever. So willow, which is one of the beaver's preferential food species, actually contains salicylic acid, which is one of the chemical compounds used in aspirin so there is actually some truth to it being um, a pain relieving uh, substance, but of course we, we now actually have aspirin, um, we don't need to use castorium. So the fur of animals of course was highly prized between the periods of kind of 1300s and uh, 1600s. Um, a charter was actually developed to help control the appropriate usage of animal pelts and the beaver is reserved for the higher classes. One beaver pelt brought in more um, income than, say, a marten pelt, but this isn't necessarily thought to be because the beaver was um, worthy, more worthy than a marten. It's because it just had a larger mass of fur on its body, so it could, it could be used more on a variety of garments. In the Middle Ages, fur was becoming quite hard to come by throughout Europe, um, with North American beavers being the only vast resource remaining. So by the time beaver hats came into fashion, between round about the 1550s to the 1850s, the beaver in Britain was likely already extinct or strongly on that trajectory. So we've had a very brief insight there into how um, even when beavers were present, there was a lot of kind of rumour and mistruth around the species. Um, and as humans, sometimes we don't actually go out of our way to find out the truth. We're, we're quite um, keen to believe rumour. And that hasn't changed, <laughs> apparently. And when it comes to the beaver, something that hasn't been here in 400 years, which might not seem like quite a long time, a lot has changed in our human society. So a lot of mistruths are starting to resurface. This isn't necessarily because people are out there trying to um, lie <laughs> about the species. It's more because we've got so much reacquainting to do with this animal that we've just had nothing to do with for so long. And now is the perfect time for us to get to know the beaver because we've got technologies that previously were unimagined, cameras and camera traps and a multitude of survey and recording data. So what better time to discover the species? So to begin with, let's actually find out what a beaver is. So despite what we may have previously thought, beavers are not fish. Beavers are in fact mammals. I'm sure a lot of you out there already know this, but let's just get all the facts out there. To be more specific, they're a semi-aquatic rodent. They're the second largest rodent in the world, trumped only by the capybara. They're around a metre long with a 50 centimetre tail, this lovely scaly paddle tail that you might have seen. And we're around about 18 kilos, so they're, they're quite large animals. Females are usually heavier than males. They live for about 5 to 10 years and are primarily nocturnal. They, they will come out in the day, but 
crepuscular times and uh, during the night are the best times to head out and see them. Beavers don't hibernate in winter, but their activity can reduce vastly during extreme weather. Um, they breed between December to February usually and tend to have a litter of around three to four kits, which are born March to May. The kits stay with the adults, which are usually a monogamous pair for two to three years before dispersing and setting up their own territories. And beaver colonies can consist of um, two to 12 individuals and tend to be family units. It's very important to note that populations are entirely dependent on water so their dispersal is linear along water courses. They're not the most agile things on land. If you've ever seen a beaver, you'll see that they're not particularly agile. So they're entirely dependent and entirely evolved around water sources. So where there's a river stretch, their territories and their dis dispersal is along that river stretch. It wouldn't be necessarily widthways, unless of course they connected the corridors. It would be linear. Taking a quick look at some of their anatomy, despite cultural references, beavers unfortunately don't slap mud on their dams with their tails. I've been waiting and watching, but I'm afraid to say that they don't do that. However, um, their tails are really useful tools to beavers. So beavers can actually remain underwater for 15 minutes, which is pretty incredible in itself. So it's an important asset as a rudder, and they can actually be quite swift and nimble in the water. Um, the tail is really important to help with that. It's also an alarm system, so they slap it on the surface of the water if they're threatened or just surprised. And of course, as you might suspect, that warns other beavers in the area and other species, actually, um, that there, there may be a threat present. They also use it as a prop when sitting or standing upright. Um, and it, it aids them when they're carrying the building materials, if you like, their mud and sticks from the land into the water. It also stores fat and it helps to regulate body temperature. So it's a, it's a multifaceted tool for the beaver. They have webbed hind feet, again, to aid with their swimming, but their hands, oh, their, uh, their forefeet, I'm so used to saying hands because if you've ever watched a beaver, they are quite human in the way they move. I don't know whether that's just me but they are quite human in the way that they're moving, that they will stand and carry things, the way that they they care for their young, they cuddle their young, you know, and they, they use their forefeet very much like hands, and that's why they're forefeet. Um, they're not webbed in the way that their hind feet are, they're very much like hands for grasping food, um, to, to carry their building materials, as I say, so that um, they're quite different to their hind feet. Speaking of food, this is another mistruth. Um, beavers do not eat fish. Popular culture really doesn't help with this. So, you know, if, if there's a rumor out there that beavers are, are going to eat the fish, I'm not surprised at all. In the Chronicles of Narnia, for example, Mrs. Beaver serves up a plate of fish and chips, wood chips, get it? Fish and chips, that's inaccurate. And um, even in a new Nintendo game, I believe, Animal Crossing, um, there's a there's some beavers in it I don't know um, but these beavers hold fishing tournaments and it's just it might not sound like much but it's little things like this that plant the seed in our minds that beavers do eat fish and that can have a really detrimental impact on how we perceive the species as a whole as you'll see later they can actually hugely benefit fish stocks they're not going to decimate them so beavers are in fact entirely herbivorous um, they have a very varied diet of grasses where they create quite neat lawns, as you can see here, along with aquatic and terrestrial plants and, of course, trees, which they're most known for. They have an incredibly impressive set of teeth which continuously grow, so gnawing trees is very important to help keep them at bay. So the teeth have a hard orange enamel surface and very soft dentine behind, which wears away with time, uh, with, with use. And they essentially, through gnawing, they create these chisel-like tools, their teeth, which are just perfect for peeling back bark and chewing through trees in order to fell them. So when it comes to eating trees, beavers prefer deciduous trees, um, and they like to eat the leaves and the, the upper branches, the thinner, softer branches, and the inner bark in particular. Um, and the species that they quite like, uh, willow, birch, aspen, um, an 
older. They can eat um, or they can fell a tree around a metre in width, which is quite large, but they do prefer to um, actually eat the, the smaller trees. So now that we've got a brief insight into how the long and quite complicated evolution of beavers completely matches their semi-aquatic lifestyles, let's have a look at how that influences the wider ecosystem. Beavers have two primary titles awarded to them, keystone species and ecosystem engineer. So just briefly, a keystone species is one that influences other species um, and the overall environment more than its general mass would allow. And they're a key, beavers are a keystone species because of their habits as an ecosystem engineer, where they quite literally engineer or create wetland habitats to suit their living habits. But all the while, they benefit an outstanding number of other species. So let's have a look at what that engineering work entails. Beavers are the masters of wetland creation, creating structures that we mimic at quite a cost. The first of their lodges, um, used as areas of shelter and safety to stay warm, give birth and raise young. Beavers can in fact burrow into riverbanks where it's not suitable or required to create a lodge. And they can have a couple of lodges per family. So lodges will feature an underwater entrance as well as a number of internal chambers uh, where the family will come and commute and feed and uh, take care of each other. Dams are the second structure, which is probably what beavers are most known for, along with felling trees. The feel and sound of flowing water stimulates beavers to build dams if necessary, which they construct using the same materials as lodges, which is uh, mud, sticks, rocks and hardy vegetation. Dams shouldn't be considered as permanent features in river systems, but in low energy drainage ditches they can be more permanent and they can create a series of dams to impound water. They're not the most agile animals on land, but in the water, they can be quite evasive. So they require round about a metre depth of water for security. So beaver ponds tend to be at least a metre in depth. Because when we talk about dams, these aren't similar um, to the concrete dams that we as humans make. They're otherwise known as leaky dams and we do recreate these particularly in upland areas where we're quite prone to flooding downstream but beavers do it um, naturally. They're perfectly evolved to do so and they build them to a certain height and structure to maintain the exact depth of water that they require. So during a flood event they might add a notch um, to allow water out by removing a small part of the structure and that helps kind of protect the integrity of the whole dam. If their dam bursts during a storm event, they work together to rebuild it. So this video here was taken at the Banff Estate in Perthshire this year, following quite a serious um, storm event which resulted in some heavy flooding. Um, and that actually broke the primary dam structure that supported the main beaver pool. But when we visited, it was just one week after the dam broke. And as you can see here, the beavers fixed it perfectly. And we were told it actually only took them three days to repair the dam. Now these beavers actually have a series of dams and, and most beavers will have a series of dams. So the top dam broke and one further downstream did as well, but the rest of them remained intact and all of that compounded water stayed back. It didn't flood downstream, it stayed back and the beavers built it back up to a, to a height that they required um, within three days. Absolutely outstanding. So this isn't to say that we can expect huge beaver dams across um, the river systems in Britain. So larger rivers tend to have that depth that beavers already require. Um, it tends to be the smaller tributaries that they dam to create that metre depth. So on the River Otter for the, the Devon Beaver Trial that quite recently concluded, only 2.5 kilometres out of, I think it was 595 kilometres of river catchment were dammed. That's a very small amount. And they actually noted that they could manage these dams through installing flow devices which help to alter the height of the water that we as humans want for the neighbouring land. The other structures that beavers make, 
They don't need building materials technically, um, but they're channels or canals. Beavers create these channels because they prefer to feed within 20 metres of the water's edge and so they require the water of course for safety to move between pools, um, the lodge and foraging sites. So they dig these out with their forefeet or their hands <laughs> and they carry the mud to help fortify their lodges or their dams or they pile it up at the edges of the channel to help um, deepen the canal structure and it's really brilliant to watch. The strength really comes to light, they can really haul mud, um, as does the phrase busy as a beaver. They really do never stop working on these incredible wetland habitats that they create. So through their dam creation and their compounding of water, their channeling, beavers help to create a lot more heterogeneity or complexity if you like in a water course. So because of this beavers play a key role in environmental ecosystem services and they're now becoming increasingly recognised in Britain as a key potential contributor to nature-based solutions for river catchment management. So for example, dams and the water compounded by each structure are a vital missing component in our existing river systems. By reducing the velocity of river water during storm events and attenuating water, beavers help to vastly reduce downstream flood risk there are numerous studies indicating this. This talk is much too short to go into all of those, but if you are interested, do get in touch. As well as that, the pools, um, the compounded water, the beaver pools, are vital in maintaining a base flow during drought events. So this is important, of course, for wildlife, but also for us as humans. The dams also act as a natural filtration surface. So it's a leaky dam, as I said, and it's packed in with all of the sticks and the stones and the mud. And this helps to improve the quality of water downstream by filtering out and trapping agricultural runoff such as phosphates and nitrates and other potential pollutants in the water downstream. This video I took at the Banff Estate again in Perthshire during a winter flood event and you can just see how clear the water is. So this is after going through around about six dams I think it might have been and you can just see how clear the water is. So one by one Every dam in that series contributed to holding back the mud, the agricultural runoff, potential pollutants into the downstream watercourse. So it's not just that. By silting up as a lot of ponds do, they help to trap and store carbon. And the vegetation that takes hold in these new wetland habitats, the additional shrubs, the additional um, aquatic and terrestrial vegetation, these all act as carbon sinks as well. So that's four vital ecosystem services that beavers can help us with pretty much for free. They can retain water for us, they can help us slow the flow of water downstream during flood events, they can provide a carbon sequestration service and they can filter water, provide a natural filtration service to improve the quality of water which is no bad thing. Okay, we've had a very brief insight into the hydrological benefits um, that beavers can bring. Let's have a very quick insight into the biodiversity benefits. Oh, the biodiversity benefits that beavers can bring are vast, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware. So this is an incredibly quick whistle stop tour. Again, get in touch if you want to find out more. At its most basic level, beavers create wetland habitats. Only 3% of land coverage in Britain is wetland habitat, whereas around 10% of our species are entirely dependent on this vital habitat, with other species of course indirectly benefiting from its presence. So let's try and get through some of these biodiversity benefits um, within a minute, because there are just so many, I could go on about them all day. Where beavers arrive, of course, they create these pond um, ecosystems and where there are ponds, freshwater invertebrates just seem to appear. They just know about it, don't they? Of course, freshwater inverts such as your damselflies, dragonflies, mayflies, midges, you name it. They start their lives out in the water for around two to five years and they provide an essential food base for other invertebrates but also for fish. Now we're going to get onto fish very soon, don't worry. Fish in turn provide a food source for the likes of otters, herons, kingfishers, you name it. 
quite a lot. Where beavers um, flood an area, they can create standing deadwood habitat too by killing the trees. Sounds like a bad thing, it's not. Standing deadwood habitat is incredibly rare in itself, but it's vital. Um, they provide essential habitat for a variety of invertebrates, but also the likes of woodpeckers, great spotted woodpeckers, for example, will of course drill their, um, their hole to have their nest inside. And after a year or so, they tend to abandon that nest. And that is when bats can move in to the abandoned hole. So beef has essentially created a B and B for bats. So they've created this uh, roosting habitat for them, and then they've created all of this incredible freshwater invertebrate life for them to forage on. As well as that, I could go on about this all day. Where beavers um, fell trees, they create, they open up the canopy, and they create this incredible um, herbaceous layer right at the water's edge and up and they also um, help to establish aquatic plants but where the terrestrial plants thrive that's where you get your pollinators and in particular moths um, I could go on about this so much but if you do want to get in touch and find out about the biodiversity benefits of beavers please do because as you can tell I could go on about them quite a lot but we've got quite a bit to cover so let's move on to fish so it often surprises people that beavers can actually benefit fish stocks. It's worth remembering as well that beavers and fish co-evolved for around 40 million years, so they've learned, fish have learned to live alongside beavers. The River Otter Beaver Trial actually identified a 37% increase in fish abundance in beaver pools compared to control sites where beavers weren't present. And that's because beavers, um, through their dam creation, of course, they compound the water for a start. Uh, they increase the abundance of invertebrate food, as we've already discussed. But in those pools, there's a whole load of woody debris and little stones that the beavers gather and put in their dams. They create all of this perfect shelter for the fish to evade potential predators. And a lot of other sites don't have that. So where beavers are present, fish abundance can increase hugely. Norway, for example, um, Norway supports 70% of the global Atlantic salmon population and um, they spawn on around 450 river systems and they share those river systems with 80,000 beavers. Now, Norway has one of the largest fishing industries. Um, I think it's worth around 127 million pounds. So it's a huge rural economy. And there is still potential for us to have that in Britain with just benefiting the ecosystem as well by welcoming beavers back. So another concern that people can have about um, beavers is that they fell trees. Um, yes. They do fell trees and um, they fell them for building materials for their lodges and their dams and also of course to eat the upper branches and those lovely soft leafy stems. Firstly, um, when a beaver fells a tree, that's not it for the tree, they coppice it. So beavers are essentially like huge water holes, they chew at a 40 or the no, at a 45 degree angle and that encourages quite a, quite a quick regrowth of that tree. And when it does regrow, it grows back almost as a shrub. So it creates a, this incredible, quite um, lacking habitat of shrubby underlayer, which is essential nesting habitat for passerines, um, for invertebrate life to thrive and for small mammals to move between these successive habitats. Um, but if we did want to prevent beavers from gnawing trees, um, you can install tree guards, which is a highly effective and cost-effective method. It's essentially chicken wire that you wrap around the tree. It takes less than 30 minutes to actually install it. Um, or you can install a kind of, or you can paint on a, a sand paint and that prevents the beavers from gnawing as well. But it is worth encouraging beavers, of course, to forage naturally because they've, they co-evolved, as I said, with all of this incredible wetland biodiversity, um, they know what they're doing. 
So when it comes to providing essential ecosystem services pretty much for free, beavers are brilliant. I might be a tad biased on that, but it's not just me who thinks so. Um, enclosed trial releases of beavers have been booming across um, England recently. You can see this map here that's created by the Beaver Trust, who I recommend you look up as well. Um, the green dots that you can see are wild populations. So the River Otter Beaver Trial is the only um, official colony, shall we say, of beavers. So a colony of beavers was known to be living on the river in 2008, but when footage emerged of kits in 2014, the government planned to remove them. Long story short, um, Devon Wildlife Trust, in collaboration with a number of beaver ecologists, the University of Exeter, and um, local stakeholders such as farmers and the, the local community, launched an outstanding campaign um, for a five-year trial to actually record the economic, um, hydrological, ecological impacts that beavers were having. And the results of this five-year trial can be found in the River Otter Beaver Report, which I highly recommend reading. But the government, DEFRA, um, approved for the beavers to remain this year, which is really exciting news and is a, a big boost to reintroducing beavers in Britain. Back up north, um, in Yorkshire that you can see there, so this is Cropton Forest near Pickering and in April 2019 the Forestry Commission introduced some beavers and these have actually had kits now and they're, they're already kind of identifying the impacts that the beavers can have even in this relatively small area on slowing the flow of water. And when it comes to Northumberland, um, in 2014 in Scapburn, uh, in Kielder Forest, there was a beaver gnawed piece of wood sticking out of the bank that three ecologists found, which I think it dated back to around 1100 or 1300, which was the latest uh, recorded evidence of beavers in Northumberland, which is pretty exciting for us, don't you think? So, to finish up, um, you might have seen the recent announcement from the Environment Agency, the dreadful announcement, that not a single river or lake has been rated as in good health in England. And on top of that, only 16% of rivers <clears throat> in England are deemed in good ecological health. So beavers, although they're not a one size fits all kind of one stop um, solution to repairing the health of our rivers, they truly are a key component in creating these nature recovery networks that can establish along the rivers to help improve the water quality and the, the ecological quality, the ecological richness of our river ecosystems. Rivers, the r network of rivers across our country are the veins of our land. So if we improve the health of these, this will help improve the health of the rest of our living ecosystems. Without beavers, our efforts alone um, will be quite ineffective and they'll be delayed and they'll be very costly. So I don't know about you, but I think it's about time we bring beavers back to Britain. To keep up to date with what we're getting up to at the Cumbria Beaver Group, you can follow us on Twitter at Cumbria Beavers or visit cumbriabeavers.org.uk you can also email us at info at and I also recommend that you have a look at these publications. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Heather. That was a really, really enjoyable talk. Um, it's a marvellous thought that we might have wild beavers living in the northeast again in the near future. I wish you every success with your conservation work as you go forward. And um, okay, everybody, thank you very much for watching. <laughs>